And a very good morning to you once again. Great to be with you and great to be able to share the Word of God once again. Well, we've now gone through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. These 11 chapters cover about 2,000 years of history. We've looked at creation, Adam and Eve, the fall, Cain and Abel, Noah and the flood. And last week we had a look at the Tower of Babel. Today we have a look at the start of God's chosen people through a man named Abraham. And if you've got your Bibles, have a look at Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to read from verse 1 through to verse 9. Genesis chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse whoever curses you. I beg your pardon. I will curse, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. They set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree at Moreh, at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued towards the Negev. Now I'm sure we know the rest of the story, <clears throat> but this morning I want to just pick on this issue of Abram being our father of faith. Abram, meaning exalted father, and later becoming Abraham, or father of many, was chosen to be the father of God's special people, the Jews. Special because through them, God brought the Savior into the world. Now, as I said, if we think about Abram, we think about faith, our father of faith. Romans chapter 4 verse 3 says, Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8, by faith Abram when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. So today, friends, I want to have a look at some lessons in faith from our father of faith, Abram. And I want you to stick with me, don't give up and go away because you heard the word faith. This is not a name it and claim it type faith. We're going to learn from the scriptures this morning and from Abram's example what faith really is. So here are some lessons in faith. Lesson number one. Faith is a gift of God. Faith is a gift of God. Verse 1 again, Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And then verse 4 says, so Abram left as the Lord had told him. Now the way God dealt with Abraham, I think, is typical of the way that God deals with all of us. See, if contact between God and sinner, or God and man, is to be established, God is the one who makes the first move. Therefore, faith is always a gift from God. Had God not come to Abram, Abram would never have believed in him. Jesus says it this way in John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit, that will last. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For it is grace you, by grace you have been saved, through faith. 
And then it says, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So, why did God choose Abram? Was he better than everybody else around him? Well, we know that Abram's father, Terah, worshipped and served idols. We read that in Joshua 24. And so, logic determines that Abram must also have worshipped these idols. Yet, even though he was an idol worshipper, God intervened in his life. So, Abram didn't have the, the best pedigree by any description. But isn't that just how God works? His undeserved love for sinners... And his sovereign choice chose Abram, who would become the father of faith, who would become the originator of the line, if you like, of our Savior. And through the people of Abram, the Savior would be born. Sometimes difficult for us to understand why God chooses some for special things and for others he doesn't. But this is his world and this is his rules. He can do whatever he likes. Romans 9, 14, what shall we say then? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And verse 16 says, and listen to this, it does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. See, if God had not given us the faith to believe, we could not have believed. Faith is always a gift of God. Second lesson we can learn from Father Abram this morning is that faith is not blind. And I think this is where many of us go wrong. Faith is not blind. See, the analogy is often used of just jump into the deep end and then find out if you can swim. Not so. You jump into the deep end and you can't swim, you're probably going to drown. And that's what happens to many believers. They, they, they grab onto this thought of faith and think it's just about throwing your brains out of the window and just jumping in and taking a chance. Well, it's not. Faith is not blind, nor is it some sort of gamble or lottery or bet. See, when God told Abram to go to a land he would tell him about, Abram went because God had given him a bunch of amazing promises. Abram didn't just go blindly. He went based upon what God had said to him. Let me read them to you again from verse 2. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Friends, faith is a certain confidence based on the rock-solid promises of a God who never lies. When God wants to move us to action, He doesn't do so by demanding he does so by promising, just so different to any other religion and so different to what we are sometimes told within our own faith or our own religion. When God tells us not to be afraid, for example, he doesn't just command it. He promises to protect us and provide us, thereby giving us a reason not to be afraid. For example, Matthew 28, we see the woman coming to the tomb and they, they're terrified because there's the angel that's, that's sitting there. And the angel says to the woman, don't be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. And then listen to what the angel says next. Just as he said. Just as he said. So the reason they didn't have to be afraid was based upon a promise. Another example, Luke chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what, or your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. And then he says, consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them, and how much more valuable you are than birds. 
Again, do not worry. And why mustn't we worry? Well, let's look at the birds. God looks after them and we're far more valuable than the birds. Friends, again, faith is not blind. And when we base our faith on our feelings, we're in trouble. True faith is founded only on God's promises and on nothing else. That's why it's so important for us to stay connected to God's Word, because it's there that we find those promises. And those promises are for us. The promises to Abram are for us. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were immersed into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then verse 29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Oh, friends, faith is not blind. Faith is backed by the promises of God's word. The third lesson we can learn from Abram's call this morning is that faith is active. Faith is a doing word. It cannot be stagnant, nor is it passive. One of our great reformers of the faith, Martin Luther, once said, faith does not sit on the heart like foam on a beer. (laughs) We see Abram's faith being active, for he responded to God's call. Verse 4 again, so Abram left as the Lord had told him. Uh, Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haram. And that would have been about midlife in terms of how long people were living in those days. But Abram's faith, this gift that had come from God, is put into action. He responds, so Abram left. He responds to activate that faith. The encouragement to me is that we don't see Abram going in now into Canaan and taking over the land and everything happening immediately. Abram had a hiccup, and that encourages me because I have so many hiccups in my journey of faith. Verse 10 we read, due to circumstances, the famine, he leaves the promised land. He leaves, he walks away from his promise, and he goes down to Egypt in verse 11 to 13, he even convinces his wife, Sarai, to be deceptive about their relationship before Pharaoh. He tells Sarai, let's just tell Pharaoh, you are my sister. Because he was afraid that, that, that Pharaoh would do something to him to get him out of the way because Sarai was such a beautiful woman. Imagine how beautiful she was. She's 70 odd years old. I mean, this is amazing stuff. But the point is this, Abram walks out of his promise. He walks away from his promise because he's now, you know, not happy with the situation or he doesn't understand or something. And we know the rest of that that story is Pharaoh finds out that this is actually um, um, Abram's wife, although it was his half-sister, so he told a half-truth. Uh, And he sends him packing from Egypt. Listen, friends, sin will always affect other people. Don't think you can tell a lie or a half-truth or anything else and get away with it. Anyway, Abram then goes back to where he started. And we see him further down in the story, going back to that same place where he left to, to run away, basically, to Egypt. And it's just amazing to me how God gives us so many opportunities to start again. All was not lost for Abram. His call was not uh, reversible. The Bible tells us that the the call of God is irrevocable. It can't be taken away. And God would still do in Abram's life what he intended to do. Now this is how that encourages me. I may feel small. I may feel that my faith is inactive or ineffective. I might even know that I've gone down to Egypt, that I've walked away from all the promises that I believed God had given to me. The good news is God's promises are are irrevocable. He will still get His people that He loves to do what He wants them to do. And His people will still do great things for Him.
Maybe you're in a place not ever having walked away, but maybe you're just sitting there thinking, but I've never done great things. My faith has never led me to do great things like Abram did. Well, think about it. I want to tell you today, you actually do do great things. And your faith is active and it does do amazing things. I mean, how is it, for example, that you can remain strong when you lose a loved one? How can you remain confident in life, for example, when you suffer the loss of everything you've ever known? Or how can you remain optimistic even when your own health is failing? I'll tell you how you can. You can because of the strength that God gives us, because of that faith that we have in His Word. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Sure of what we hope for in His Word. Certain of the promises we might not see in His Word. So if you've ever been envious of Abram's faith, wishing you could trust as he did, you can and probably do without even realizing it. But maybe you need a restart, you know, push that restart button. Maybe you do need to go back to where you should be. Whatever, plant your faith in his word and watch your faith become active. Lesson number four from Father Abram is that faith takes exercise to make it stronger, like anything, unfortunately, our physical bodies or whatever it is. It takes exercise to make it stronger. When Abram arrived in Canaan, there were Canaanites, Canaanites in the land. It wasn't just an empty land. There were people there. God hadn't brought Abram to an empty piece of real estate. He could just simply take over. But the people were there and established. And on top of it, there was famine in the land. Now God did this so that Abram would be forced to rely on his promise that his descendants would inherit that land. And and. It wasn't dependent on the fact that there was famine. It wasn't dependent on the fact that there were people there. It was his promise. God had promised. Therefore, it would be. Friends, God still puts us in situations where we're forced to rely upon his promises. Where we are forced to exercise our faith. See, head knowledge needs to become a matter of heart knowledge. It needs to become an issue of taste for myself and see that the Lord has, is good. COVID-19 has been a wonderful faith exerciser. And if it hasn't been for you, then I don't know what planet you're on. For everybody else, it's been, an, it's been a, a, a very, very trying time. And I want to just encourage you that these times come to exercise us, to grow our faith. So when God puts us in this situation, it's not an issue of why me, but it should be a thank you, Lord. Thank you for an opportunity <laughs> to exercise. I remember going, I used to go for annual medical aviations when I... Uh, aviation medicals when I was still flying and it was always a nightmare experience just to make sure that I made the grade and I remember my my aviation doctor telling me once that I've got to treat uh, exercise like medicine he said just do it <laughs> you've just got to do it take it like medicine now sometimes it might seem like our faith is like that it's just medicine I want to say just do it but do it in an attitude of gratitude. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, and then it goes on to say, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Trials and tribulations will come our way, John 16, 33. Jesus said it. it. It will come your way. But we can take heart because He, Jesus, has overcome this world. And that means His word is still true. And every single trial, every tribulation, every hardship is a glorious opportunity for growth in Him. Friends, faith takes exercise 
to make it stronger. Don't fight against it. Embrace it and know that your faith is growing if it's based upon the Word of God. If it's based upon those promises in His Word, you will come through stronger. And then the last little thought this morning, number five, lesson five, is that faith is a public matter. Now, sometimes we don't like talking about this, do we? We don't like to think of our faith as being more than that which happens in our heart. But it is, and it has to be, and Abram's call teaches us that. Again, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 7 to 8, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. From there he went towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. There were people about. He did that in the midst of Canaanite religions. In the midst of godless worship, he did that. He called on the name of Yahweh, the Lord. Quite amazing, just an interesting little side here. Bethel means house of God, and Ai means heap of runes. <laughs> so somewhere between Bethel, somewhere between heaven and the heap of runes, there he created his altar. He built his altar. And that's exactly what we need to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Abram's faith was displayed for all to see. He didn't hide the fact that he worshipped a different God than the Canaanites. Rather, he goes and builds a couple of altars right there where everybody can see and proclaims the name of the Lord. Luke chapter 8 verse 16, Jesus said, No one lights a lamp and hides it in a jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. Friends, faith is a public matter. We should take every opportunity to share the goodness of God wherever we are. And I'm not saying you have to go and stand on your roof and shout it out. Or, but I'm telling you this, that if you live your life as God would have you live your life, He is going to be on display in your life. Where everybody else is complaining, you go, you're not going to be complaining. Where everybody else is stressing about what's going to happen and how we're going to get out of this and what's next, you're, not, you're going to have a quiet confidence because of faith that God has given you in His promises. God has given us this wonderful gift of faith. We've got no right to hide it. And listen, there are just so many amazing opportunities on a daily basis to demonstrate the life of God in us and the hope we have in His promises in us. Faith, our faith, it's not a crutch for weaklings. It's a dynamic display of the power and promises of God in this fragile humanity. And I want to encourage you this morning, cherish your faith, because it is the only thing that you have that will translate into an inheritance that will never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. Oh, Father Abram, you've done some good stuff for us this morning. Let's go back through those five points quickly in summary. Number one. Faith is a gift from God. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You will ne never get it. He chose you. He is the one who enabled you to believe Him in the first place and will continue to do so. Lord, thank you for your faith. Number two, faith is not blind. It's not just a jump in the deep end. It's uh, standing on the promises of Christ my King, old hymn we used to sing. That's what it's about. It's knowing that His promise, every promise, is yes and amen in Christ. And through us, the amen is spoken to the glory of God. Faith is not blind. It's based on His promises. Number three, faith is active. We have to do something. We've got to act upon. So Abram left. 
We have to act upon that promise. Number four, faith requires exercise. Don't begrudge the hard times in life. Embrace them and use them to grow your faith and to mature in your faith. And number five, don't try and hide your your bushel, your light under a bed. Let it shine for everyone to see. God is good and he's coming again. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for the life of Abram. And thank you for these lessons of faith that we could learn this morning. We honor you. We praise you. We bless you that you are the giver of that gift of faith to us. That we could believe you in the first place. And we say thank you for that. Lord, I pray for everyone right now who's really struggling. For those who are struggling even in their faith. Maybe those who have to push the restart button. Who've got to go back and it just feels like they're never going to get back from Egypt to you. I thank you, Lord. That your word is true. That if we confess, if we agree with you uh, in our wrongdoings, in our sin, in our wickedness, in our self-centeredness, in the wrong paths that we've taken, if we agree with you, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So I thank you, Lord, that you encourage us this morning, even those who are weak, even those who are struggling. Thank you that your flame of encouragement is burning again in our hearts to come back, to plant that altar and to make it known amongst the nations that Jesus Christ He is Lord. Amen and amen. Thanks so much for joining with us again this morning. Next week, we're going to be having a look at those three visitors. uh, And uh, I know that we're going to enjoy some interesting lessons out of that. Those three that came to visit Abram and Sarah. Remember when she laughed? We're going to talk about that next week. Look forward to seeing you again. God willing. Bye-bye.